been reminded again this week, conversations with some friends across the aisle, that uh, there are some people in here with whom I have extremely different views, but I know them, and they got good hearts. They want to do the right thing. We just disagree on what that is. There was a lot said today um, in the debate over the Voting Rights Act change. Some have tried to say, and, and they've been just mistaken. They, I don't think they were intentionally trying to um, misrepresent anything. But what we voted on today was not a reauthorization of the Voting Rights Act. The Voting Rights Act has been in effect. It is still in effect. But going back to the previous reauthorization, came through the Judiciary Committee I'm on, and it became clear that between the Republican and Democrat leader in judiciary, there was an agreement, and they weren't going to allow changes to their agreement. And I pointed out to both of them back at the time, you have a provision in here that is reauthorized that will punish states for sins committed by grandparents, in some case great-grandparents, that happened decades before. Many cases, decades before some were born that were there. This, this is not supposed to be a country where we intentionally punish the children or grandchildren of somebody who committed an offense. And there was wrongdoing in preventing people from voting. And the Voting Rights Act addressed that. But it was reauthorized more than once, continuing to punish the same states that it found to be lacking. And the data we had at the previous uh, reauthorization showed clearly there were some districts in places like New York, Wisconsin, California. Um, there were places where the voting disparity, racial disparity, was worse than in the states that were still being punished. And I know some say, well, it's not a punishment for the federal government to say you're not trustworthy and so you don't get to uh, be in charge of your elections. We have to approve every single thing you do. Uh, that is an extraordinary and basically unconstitutional action by the federal government that has been deemed to be constitutional, but only until such time as the states that were offending have corrected the situation. Um, so I know there was one newspaper in my district uh, that reported I was against the voting rights reauthorization. And when I provided them a copy of my transcript from the reporters, stenographers here, exactly as it was, and they read what I actually said instead of taking talking point from the left-wing, alt-left media. Uh, the editor at the time, I, I know she, from things she would said, she apparently a Democrat, but she was an honorable person, and they printed uh, correction and corrected what they had said. I was in favor of voting rights reauthorization, but not to continue to punish states that were in not in violation and hadn't been for decades. So, in fact, my amendment would have required the punitive parts of the Voting Rights Act to apply to any state in the union that was found to be in violation of uh, the constitutional protections on voting. And 
I pointed out to the Republican leader at the time and Democratic leader was John Conyers. And actually, uh, John Conyers was more open to making the change. And he says, well, you made a good point. Let me talk to some of our lawyers about it. Republican leader said, absolutely not. We're not changing anything at all. And I said, but this is going to be struck down. I mean, there's some things we don't really know. This is one that's going to be struck down. Why risk the court just striking the whole thing down? If you'll allow my amendment, it will be constitutional. It won't any of it be struck down. And the Republican leader at the time said, absolutely not. And Mr. Conyers came back to me later and said, I've talked to our lawyers and they say, you do make a good point, but since we have an agreement on it, it's just easier if we go forward and if they strike something down, they strike it down. Well, the Supreme Court came back and did just what I said they would do. They struck down an unconstitutional part that I tried to amend and make it constitutional. But um, that's where we are. This, this uh, today does not reauthorize the Voting Rights Act. And it is interesting hearing comments from folks across the aisle about why this is so important that we don't disenfranchise votes. And if you look at what the activity is, and, and even saying, oh, there are 17 million people that have been disenfranchised because they're no longer allowed to vote. And despite what some who make comments online might say, I'm not stupid. I've won awards at every school I've been in. But I know that traditionally dead people who vote, vote Democrat. That's just been the way. We had, Republicans have had a very difficult time getting dead people to vote Republican. And uh, William F. Buckley talked about an uncle he had had that voted Republican his whole life until the year after he died, and then he started voting Democrat. And he said he wasn't kidding that it actually happened there in Texas. But uh, sometimes we kid about it. Uh, Lyndon Johnson, according to David Brinkley, told a story back in the 60s to reporters about how when he was running for Congress, that he and his campaign manager were going through the cemetery, writing down names of people they needed to have vote the next day. And uh, they got to one tombstone and you couldn't read the name. There was moss and all this stuff on it. And so the campaign manager said, come on, Lyndon, let's go to the next tombstone. Johnson said, I grabbed him and I told him, no, sir, this man has ever been as much right to vote as anybody else in the cemetery. And it was funny, and people laughed, but people that knew about the discrepancies in Duval County and the Dukes of Duval and the voting irregularities and investigation and the courthouse burning with the records, uh, those kind of things uh, were what got reported, and Johnson was able to get a good joke out of it. But nonetheless, it's still true. If you find somebody who's dead who has voted uh, normally, they voted Democrat. So I hope that my friends will understand some of the people that are talking about being disenfranchised by what Republicans want to do to fix election law. Will di it will disenfranchise uh, the dead who are continuing to vote. Uh, their vote will not be allowed to count as it did when they were alive. Uh, we also have had millions reported to have voted who were in this country illegally or voted more than once, registered more than one place. And uh, as my friend John Fund used to be a writer with the uh, Wall Street Journal, uh, John had a book on voting fraud, a fantastic book. Uh, and I've heard him say to me, you know, the biggest fraud about elections is the statement that there's no election fraud today. So this Voting Rights Act amendment that was voted on by the House today is yet another effort for the federal government 
to ignore the Constitution and ignore the mandate that elections are to be controlled locally. And that's, according to the Tenth Amendment, not just reserved to the states and people, it's specifically talked about. And exceptions have been made over the years that allow the federal government to have some say. Uh, and that was the case because of abuses and people that were prevented from voting. So I'm surprised that we have colleagues here that want, don't want uh, the dead people to be disenfranchised whose names have been taken off rolls uh, in areas where Republicans are trying to update the voting rolls. Uh, and I understand my colleagues, they're not stupid either. They know that dead people vote more for Democrats than Republicans. So I get it and why they would want to keep them voting. But it is something that needs to be done. The other vote we had today um, regarding uh, Israeli-Palestinian uh, two-nation peace, uh, peace with two independent states, I couldn't vote for that. I pray for the peace of Israel, but I couldn't vote for that. A two-state solution being rammed down the throat of the one of the parties that doesn't want to totally destroy those who want to totally destroy them I mean, we send money over to the Palestinians still. It's one of the things that uh, President Trump has been wanting to do. He agreed with me once when, when I pointed out, you know, we don't have to pay people to hate us. They'll do it for free. And uh, th there is corruption different places around the world, and especially there has been in Ukraine. And I was glad that President Trump was trying to do something about it. Obviously, President Obama didn't do anything about it. And we have a huge effort now by our friends across the aisle that want to stop the reform and the elimination of uh, corruption in Ukraine that President Trump was trying to undertake. Um, and apparently, Ukraine has been quite helpful to our friends across the aisle. Uh, Obviously, in the last presidential campaign, there's plenty of information to indicate they were trying to help Hillary Clinton, and that's why they. <clears throat> it was reported that after the election, they realized, well, gee, since we were trying to help Hillary Clinton, maybe we better try to warm up to uh, Donald Trump. But when it comes to Israel and a an effort to push through a two-state solution. Uh, forcing Israel to sign an agreement or an effort to try to push them to sign an agreement with the Palestinians, while the Palestinians, in response to each bilateral and unilateral effort that Israel has made to reach out with an olive branch, try to bring about an effort at peace, they have been slapped down. And as a result of those efforts at peace, Israelis have died and places have been destroyed and Israelis live in fear. All you have to do is go to southern Israel and you find out, because they come in every day, these rockets get fired. They're not that accurate on where they hit, so nobody can be sure they won't hit them. They're home. The homes there have to have a, a safe place within there so that when the warning comes, which may only be seconds before the rocket hits, uh, you have to grab your kids and head for the safe room and hope that you aren't killed. And I heard from one mother once when I was over there, the rockets were flying from the strip that Israel had unilaterally given as a show of peace and effort to reach out unilaterally, asking nothing in return. I thought it was a huge mistake, but they did it. And as a result, rockets fly every day. But this lady was saying she had her little son in the car and the warning sounded, the siren, she didn't have time to get her child to a safe place. So 
she laid on top of him in the car seat, put him down on the car seat and laid on top of him. And when the rockets hit far enough away that it was not a threat to them and the rockets stopped temporarily, and she sat up, her son cried and said, Mama, if you're going to die, I don't want to keep living. Don't do that to me again. I want to be with you wherever you are. This kind of stuff gets played out day after day in Israel because the Palestinians want to wipe them off the map. They don't want any Jews between the river, Jordan, and the sea, the Mediterranean. And they make that very clear. We want to wipe them out. And they've never agreed to back off of that position. And it's pretty clear that no matter what kind of agreement you have, when you are still teaching children in your schools, which receive money from the United States, that Jews are vermin and rats and, and they need to be wiped out. The same kind of things the Nazis were saying and printing. They print them. They say them. They teach them. And we're going to want to do them favor, send them more money. And while they use money themselves to teach that kind of hatred. So... I was mentioning to my friends Lee Zeldin earlier today that uh, if the Democrats who were pushing through this demand for a two-state solution were successful, then they could historically stand with Neville Chamberlain and say, as he did, this two-state solution means peace in our time when actually it would just be a precursor to the killing of millions of Jews. We don't need a two-state solution where one of those states is still intent on wiping Israel off the map. It made no sense, and the people on this side of the aisle most everybody, I think, uh, voted against it. Not that they were against peace in the Middle East. Of course we are. But we've also heard yesterday, well, actually Wednesday, yesterday, and today, a lot made about a comment by President Trump when he was talking about whether he would fire uh, Mr. Mueller, Robert Mueller, as special counsel. This article by Charlie Spearing, 6 December, points out that here's what the, pres what, uh, the president said. Article 1 is the legislative branch. Article 2 is the executive branch. And the president said, Article, one, Article 2 says, I can do whatever I want. So for me, this is about honoring our oath of office making sure that the Constitution is respected and it's about that and how uh, he has ignored the subpoenas. Oh, I'm sorry, this is Pelosi's. Here's what Trump said. Look, Article 2, I would be allowed to fire Robert Mueller, assuming I did all the things I said I want to fire him. Uh, number one, I didn't. He wasn't fired. Very importantly, uh, but more importantly, Article 2 allows me to do whatever I want. Article 2 would allow me to fire him. I wasn't going to fire him. You know why? Because I watched Richard Nixon firing everybody, and that didn't work out too well for him. So that is the context the president was talking about. Yes, he's exactly right. He had the authority to fire Robert Mueller. I encouraged him not to fire him, just to appoint a special prosecutor in, to investigate Bob Mueller and uh, why in the world he would hire nothing but people that hated him. He, had the, he said, could I do that? I said, yeah. The, the authority of the attorney general to hire and fire a special prosecutor comes from the president. It's his power, and he could do it if he wanted to, and he's exactly right. Article 2 would allow him to fire Mueller, which he never did. So when the speaker 
takes that quote, I can do whatever I want, when he's talking about whether or not he were to fire Robert Mueller and try to apply that, this is why we've got to remove him from office. That is such a dangerous, dangerous direction to go. It's why I was so saddened to hear that our speaker wants to now move forward with articles of impeachment. As Jonathan Turley testified before us um, Wednesday, the, the, this bar is so low. And historically speaking, when a governing document like our Constitution is degenerated to this point, you don't normally come back from that. And what you could expect historically, if um, my friends do as they say they're going to do, they're going to vote to impeach President Trump. And he hadn't committed any crime. He's tweeted out some offensive tweets. But to have a bar this low and try to, for the first time in American history, remove a duly elected president, then any president, regardless of party, in the future can expect that when the opposition party controls the House, that they will spend two to four years, however long the opposing party is in power, in fighting impeachment. That's what this will do for the future. Now, I know some of our Democratic colleagues have seen before that they can attack Republicans. They can be unfair. They can encourage people to be unfair to Republicans. And Republicans will not want to treat others the way they got treated when it was so unfair. And I can't help but wonder if people think, you know, we can do this to them and they won't do it to a Democratic president. There were people who were often pointing out to me bases for President Obama to be impeached, going back to Fast and Furious, all kinds of things that we should have been investigating but at the time, we had a speaker that didn't want to go to court and get uh, court orders in order to get the documents that were demanded. So we had a show vote um, holding contempt, but it was meaningless unless we went to court and had it enforced by a court order. As Jonathan Turley was saying, uh, is the right of the Congress or the uh, president to do. And if the Congress or the president does that, it's not an impeachable offense for the member of Congress or the president. It's a constitutional right. And once the court orders that it has to be produced or orders that it does not have to be produced, then if the president or the Congress says, well, I'm not going to abide by the court order, then that gets you into an area that you may want to look at impeachment. But that's not what's happened here. But it's what next couple of weeks' actions may lead us to. So it's unfortunate that the president's comments taken out of context and whether or not he had the power to fire Mueller, he was right, he did. Article 2 gives him that power. And then say, oh, he thinks he can do anything he wants to do. Well, no, if he thought he could do anything he wanted to do, if he was a monarch, then he would uh, just say, you know what, I'm going to take all of the money, I'm going to shut down the Department of Education totally and divert all that money to securing our border, protecting American citizens as he wants to do. He's made it very clear. But instead, he can only take some money here that is under the law, open enough that it could be used for the purpose of building a wall. Otherwise, he'd have a wall all built by now. But he knows he's not a monarch. 
So it's a pretty outrageous thing to say. Um, but when it comes to going to court, uh, Daniel Huff, a smart lawyer, used to uh, be at the Judiciary Committee here, and had an article published in the Wall Street Journal. Uh, the Supreme Court last week blocked a House committee subpoena for eight years' worth of President Trump's tax returns. The committee will press the matter in further litigation, but the logic that supports the subpoena undercuts House Democrats' effort to impeach Mr. Trump for asking Ukraine to investigate Joe Biden. In both cases, the use of official power to get dirt on a political rival is consistent with a broader valid official purpose, and that is to try to fight corruption. So Daniel Huff makes great point in that uh, editorial that he wrote. From the um, what we were dealing with in the Judiciary Committee on Wednesday, um, if we are really going to examine a report, and we find out there's a hearing Monday morning at 9 a.m., I ask, well, who are, the, who are the witnesses? Well, we don't know yet. Well, what are we going to be taking up? Well, we don't know yet. Well, you're trying to destroy the presidency, remove a man out of office, something so serious that the founders would say, this is something that rises to the level. It needs to be treasonous. It's got to be really serious. And under the Constitution itself, it makes very clear, you cannot convict someone of treason under this Constitution, federal court, unless you have the direct testimony of two witnesses. And all they had was hearsay on hearsay on hearsay. So they can't try President Trump for something like treason because they don't have two direct witnesses. And so much of what they brought would never be allowed admitted into court. But we deserve to hear from former members who of the Obama administration who um, were holdovers, and I know that um, Mr. McMasters made a comment that he didn't want to hear any more of his employees uh, at the National Security Council ever mentioned the word holdover that uh, just because somebody was hired by the Obama administration and Trump hadn't gotten rid of them yet didn't mean they were holdovers. They are government employees. Well, no, they were holdovers. And he should never have been in the position he was. Spent his time trying to undermine the president best he could. But um, as of March of this year, our own speaker said impeachment must be, quote, compelling and overwhelmingly bipartisan. She's violating her own statement if she has this go forward next week. In 1998, our own Judiciary Chairman Nadler said there must never be a narrowly voted impeachment supported by one of our major political parties and opposed by the other. Such would produce divisiveness in our politics and will call into question the very legitimacy of our political institutions. And you know what? Jerry Nadler was exactly right when he said that. They go through with this in the next two weeks or in January, whenever. He's going to do exactly what he said, which is what Jonathan, Professor Turley, Jonathan Turley said. It's going to produce even more divisiveness in this country and will call into question the very legitimacy of our political institutions. It absolutely will. He was right back then. I don't know what's happened since 1998 when he was so acutely aware of the Constitution and the ramifications of actions like they're taking now. But this is where we are. Some of us were encouraged to file impeachment on President Obama. And some were angry that I wouldn't file for impeachment of President Obama. But I cared 
so deeply about this country. I knew if we had impeachment proceedings on President Obama, no matter what he did, this country would be so divided it would never recover. Of course, it, we became much more divided during those uh, years. Somebody asked me, well, was uh, when President Obama was in office, uh, uh, did you ever have any positive thoughts about him being president? I said, when he was elected, I didn't vote for him, but I thought, you know what? He could end up being like Coach Williams was to us back um, where I grew up. I said, Coach Williams was my favorite coach. He happened to be black. And uh, I love the guy. He was, he was such a great coach. But he brought us all together as a team. We had a few good athletes, but most were like me. And I was a quarterback and captain on the team at the time. And he brought us together. He treated everybody tough, but he treated everybody the same. And we came together as a team, and we had – an extremely winning team. Didn't win every game, nearly did, but he was a great coach. And I hoped, and I didn't mention to the reporter I was quarterback, but uh, I said, I hoped that President Obama would bring us together as a nation the way Coach Williams did as a team. I didn't say what sport or what position I played. So the first story I see about my comment from some big liberal was how I said my high school basketball coach was my favorite coach. Apparently, if you're real liberal like that reporter was, you just assume, oh, well, if he was a black coach, it must have been basketball. I didn't say basketball or football. She, she just assumed it. <laughs> I found that rather ironic. But... Uh, one of my great joys last year, uh, I got to, I was asked to come speak to my old alma mater high school, try to fire them up before the game. And somebody told me Coach Williams was up in the press box. And so I went up there, arms flew open by both of us, uh, he's just a good man, just a good man. He was a great coach, and I treasure the times I got to play with him. But that hadn't happened here. Country got more divided. But Cheryl Atkinson had a good uh, um, account, and uh, this was November 25th and updated November 30th. Some of the things she pointed out was, Mueller, as anti-Trump as he and all Weissman, all those folks were that he hired, uh, Mueller testified there were instances of Russian social media support for Hillary Clinton as well. Try to find that in the mainstream media. She also says, according to reporting by Politico, though, in January 2017, it's hard to find a Politico now because they... I'm sure deeply regret they ever reported this, but they reported back then efforts by Democrats and Ukraine to sabotage the Trump campaign in 2016 did impact the race, even though Trump won in the end. She points out in March of 2016 that Ali Chalupa reportedly met with top Ukrainian officials at the Ukrainian embassy in Washington in an effort to tarnish the Trump campaign by exposing, quote, ties between Trump, top cam campaign aide Paul Manafort, and Russia, unquote, according to Politico. Now, this um, is Alexandra Chalupa. She uh, was a consultant with the Democratic National Committee in 2016, and previously worked under the Clinton administration. And uh, she acknowledged in 2017 
that she worked as a consultant for the DNC during the 2016 campaign with the goal of publicly exposing Trump campaign aide Paul Manafort's links to pro-Russia politicians in Ukraine. Chalupa admitted coordinating with the Ukrainian embassy and with Ukrainian and U.S. news reporters. But in August 8th of 2016, uh, that's when Peter Strzok wrote to Lisa Page that they would stop Trump from becoming president. Ukraine had formed the National Anti-Corruption Bureau in 2014 as a condition to receive aid. Why? Because nominally the Obama administration wanted to say, as Congress was dictating back then, that we wanted to see some advances in anti-corruption by Ukraine. A recent poll indicated that in the last year, 68% of those randomly chosen for the poll had bribed a government official, 68%. And that's just here recently. But August 19th of 2016, Manafort resigned as Trump campaign chairman. I think he was only there maybe three months, something like that. The same day, Ukrainian parliament member Sergei Leschenko, who was part of the Petro Poroshenko bloc, held a news conference to draw attention to Manafort and Trump's pro-Russia ties. The original link to a photograph of the news conference was recently removed. But at the news conference in Ukraine, Leschenko was said to be exposing, quote, a firm run by U.S. businessman, Republican Party presidential candidate Donald Trump's campaign chairman, Paul Manafort, who reportedly directed, directly orchestrated a covert Washington lobbying operation on behalf of Ukraine's ruling political party, attempting to sway the American public's opinion in favor of the country's pro-Russian government. Anyway, um, those are some of the things that were going on that really need to be investigated. And one of the, the important results to some of those who appear to have been conspiring with Ukraine, Americans who appear to be conspiring with Ukraines to affect our U.S. election, um, gee, they did have an effect, but it wasn't enough to change the outcome of the 2016 election. But in 2018, Senator Ron Johnson, chairman of the Homeland Security Committee in the Senate, and Chuck Grassley, Iowa chairman of the Finance Committee, had asked Attorney General William Barr and FBI Director Christopher Wray for various records, including forensic images of Chalupa's devices. They're seeking records also from National Archives to obtain White House visitor logs regarding any meetings between Chalupa, Ukrainians, and Obama officials. August 8, 2018, Peter, well, oh, that's when um, Strzok wrote page they'd stop Trump, but that's 2016, okay. So, this has been going on for some time, and more information has come out. Aaron Klein had a good article, uh, November 26, that a second Adam Schiff staffer linked to Burisma-backed think tank, Burisma being the company that's paid millions to people to be on their boards, including Hunter Biden, but... Um, this article is very interesting uh, that another staffer for Adam Schiff served as fellow for the Atlantic Council think tank funded by and work in partnership with Burisma. Um, isn't that convenient? Uh, but Sean Misko says um, was close friends with a guy named Eric Chiromella. Chiromella. Um, and in 2015, Sean Misko was a year-long millennial fellow at the Burisma-funded Atlantic, Atlantic Council. Uh, Thomas Eager, a staffer on Schiff's House Intel Committee staff, is currently a fellow at the Atlantic Council's Eurasia Congressional Fellowship. 
and that educates congressional staff on current events in the Eurasia region, which is obviously uh, the take on issues that Burisma wants them to have, or they wouldn't have funded this thing. So Burisma co-signed a cooperative uh, agreement with the council to specifically sponsor the Atlantic Council Eurasia Center, where Eager now serves as, or serves as a fellow. Um, but a trip to Ukraine in August, organized by the Atlantic Council, real that Eager and others had a meeting with acting U.S. Ambassador Bill Taylor. That name should ring a bell. But uh, may have been perfectly innocent, but nonetheless, Burisma has helped fund some things for uh, some of Adam Schiff's staff. And of course, it quotes um, Chairman Schiff on September 17th, saying we've not spoken directly with the whistleblower. We would like to. And of course, it turns out his staff had talked with him. And in fact, that's apparently the first people that um, um, were talked to about the conversation for good reason. Um, MISCO is listed as providing a small donation of up to $999 to that think tank in 2016, but um, also contributions from the Open Society Network that George Soros had so much to do with. Uh, another big donor, Perkins Coey, the law firm that was used to help the DNC and the Clinton campaign with hiring GP, uh, Fusion GPS and Christopher Steele and getting the uh, Russian dossier hoax going. But it's just amazing when you start seeing, wait a minute, uh, there was a lot going on between people in our government and Ukrainian government, corrupt people over there. And then we find out uh, Kerry Pickett, October 11th, reported Abigail Grace, who worked at the NSC until 2018, was hired in February, while Sean Misko, National Security Council aide, um, until 2017, joined Schiff's staff in late August. That was the best information they had at the time. But uh, she points out that uh, Abigail Grace, 36, was hired to help Schiff's committee investigate the Trump White House. Well, she had worked for the Trump White House as an Obama holdover. That month, uh, in, um, Trump accused Schiff of stealing people who work at the White House. Uh, she had worked there 2016 to 2018, and briefly for the Center for a New American Security Think Tank, founded by two former senior Obama administration officials, but Sean Misko, 37, worked in the Obama administration as a member of the Secretary of State's policy planning staff under Deputy Chief of Staff Jake Sullivan, who became Hillary Clinton's top foreign policy official during her 2016 presidential campaign. 2015, Misko was the director of the Gulf States at the NSC, remaining there into the Trump administration's first year. A uh, source familiar with Grace's work at the NSC told the Washington Examiner, Abby Grace had access to executive privilege information. She has a duty not to disclose that information. She's not authorized to reveal that information. Same source said that Misko had not been trusted by Trump appointees. Quote, there were a few times when documents had been signed off for final editing before they go to the National Security Advisor for signature. And he actually went in and made changes after those changes were already finished. So basically, he tried to insert without his boss's, boss's approval. And there were meetings in which he protested very heavily. And the next thing you know, there's an article in the paper about the contents of that meeting. Ms. Go often clashed with other NSC personnel at the meetings. Another source said both Grace and Misko were close to Lieutenant General H.R. McMaster, Trump's national security advisor, unfortunately, from February 2017 to May of 2018. Misko was a CNAS fellow in 2014, 
name surfaced in the Hillary Clinton email controversy when he worked in the State Department during the Obama administration. December 1 of 2009, email released by Judicial Watch, Clinton advisor Huma Abedin sent classified information regarding foreign military contributions to the Afghanistan war effort to a private email account that email originally originated with Misko, who wrote to Sullivan that he initially accidentally sent it on the high side, but which is secure, but sending the email again, Intelligence Committee did not respond to a request for comment. And then updated information, December 3rd, Kerry Pickett reports that actually House Intelligence Committee Chairman Adam Schiff hired a former National Security Council aide during the Obama and Trump administrations the day after the phone call between President Trump and Ukrainian President Zelensky. So it turns out Call on July 25th, July 26th, Sean Misko gets hired. Sean Misko, Abigail Grace, Eric Chiramella, they had worked together at the National Security Council. Uh, in fact, Misko and Chiramella, they were reported to be brother-like or bro-like, that they were just always hanging around. And then we find out that uh, after the phone call, Apparently, Chair Mellon goes over to the staff, and based on what we know, appears to me, my opinion, that uh, he goes over there and says, wow, you know, all the work we did with Biden, with Ukraine, maybe they were saying maybe uh, the work we did trying to set some things up to help the Clinton campaign. Um, whatever it was, they were scared. Clearly, they were scared. And somebody comes up with the idea, why not use the whistleblower statute, even though it really didn't apply? And, you know, some people say, oh, you guys, you know, you're all dead set on getting the whistleblower. The whistleblower, as a whistleblower, whoever it is, is irrelevant. But these three key people, including Misko and Grace, that work together at the Obama administration and the Trump administration temporarily at the National Security Council that worked with Ukraine, worked with Biden. You know, these people are at the heart of everything about this whole Ukrainian hoax. Why are we having a Ukrainian hoax? Because all the other hoaxes were exposed and that's, maybe that's why we're rushing through this in record time so that people don't find out more about how this all came about. But we need to talk to Alexandra Chalupa. She met with people involved in this, and including Ukrainians. Uh, Misko and Abigail Grace and uh, Chermella. Regardless, it doesn't matter who the whistleblower was. What matters is the information these people know about what went on with Ukraine's interference in our election. You, not the country officially, but the Ukrainian officials that interfered. And what all went on, they're in it up to their eyeballs. We need to be able to talk to these people. And these are the three people, well, four people, that... Neither Adam Schiff nor Jerry Nadler are willing to produce. Now, I made the request, provided it to our ranking member under 660, H.R. 660. He has to provide it, and apparently there's somebody he had to talk to before he was willing to provide it, but at least I'm making that request. To be official, our ranking member has to hand it over needs to be done. We need to be able to talk to these people before they irreparably destroy the institutions, as Jerry Nadler said, this kind of impeachment would. We need to talk to the people that got it all, that brought about the circumstances in dealing with Ukraine, Biden, Russia. Um, we, need to, we need to be able to question them about Ukraine, about Biden, about Russia and all these intermingling ties.
It is critical. We have got to be able to have that. Um, and of course, reference um, same person in the Mueller report even, um, where he's in the Mueller report is shown or is indicated uh, to be the source of allegations that Russia told or Putin told Trump to fire Mueller or Comey. Um, in any event, this is all rather tragic where partisan politics, just as Jerry Nadler predicted in 1998, is about to take a huge step toward finishing off this little experiment in self-government. No government lasts forever. This one won't. But the actions that are being taken now have far-ranging consequences toward destroying the best hope for freedom the world has ever had. People may hate this country, but you talk to people honestly around the world that have some freedom, like I did with three people from Australia, and I was kidding around. I said, I had a few members say, if, if we lose our freedom, we can all go to Australia. And none of them smiled even. One of them said, do you not understand? If you lose your freedom here in the United States, China will take us over before you could ever get there. You've got to be strong. I heard that in Nigeria when I went to meet with mothers whose children had been kidnapped and were being raped daily. And officials there said, well, you know, your Obama administration said if, if we want more help with Boko Haram, we got to adopt same-sex marriage and we got to have abortions. And as one uh, Catholic bishop reported, our religious beliefs are not for sale, not to the Obama administration, not to anybody. So it's not uncommon, as we've been told, and some people want to deny, but uh, there are good reasons to withhold aid. I don't think trying to force somebody to change their religious beliefs, like in Nigeria and Kenya and some Togo, some of the places I talked with officials, but uh, but nonetheless, there's nothing wrong with it if it's a legitimate purpose. And what President Trump is trying to get the bottom of, you know, it legitimate purpose. How do you stop corruption? from foreign countries in our 2020 election if you're not allowed to figure out what they did in 2016. We need to be able to know that in order to stop it from happening again. This is really serious stuff. This, this is, it, and I appreciate the comments that so many who are participating on the other side of the aisle have made in talking about um, this impeachment, and of course, we even heard that from uh, Feldman from Harvard. Oh, he was reluctant to, to bring up this impeachment. And, you know, my gosh, the guy was all over Twitter over two years ago. Oh, he thought, gee, we may be able to impeach Trump for his tweet. Oh, we may be able to impeach him for this, that, that. This guy's been talking about it forever. He had no qualms about wanting to impeach Trump using any little thing possible until he comes before our committee, and then he's reluctant. And we've heard that from some other people. We're, we're reluctant to pursue this impeachment. Well, you sure can't tell it the way you're moving forward, like you've got a posse and ready to hang somebody that you just run into. So uh, let me just finish up by stating something I hope. You know, it was reported this week that, or, that um, after the Intelligence com Committee's Democratic staff had finished rolling up this ball of collusion and uh, supposedly sending it to the Judiciary Committee, it was reported that the Speaker provided a, a cake and it was decorated as a flag. There was a big drinking celebration. And so I hope that if the Judiciary Committee does what I really do hope and pray they don't, and that is 
move forward with impeachment on something Trump didn't even do wrong, that if they have another celebration for the judiciary staff and people are drinking and eating cake and have a good time, I hope they will continue to do their drinking and celebration prayerfully, reluctantly, and soberly, as we've heard they are approaching all of this. With that, I yield back.